So hey guys, my name is Peter Dolak, as you heard. Uh, since you've already heard about me, let me tell you a bit more about what Exponia is. It's the company where I work for three years, and it's a relatively young Slovak company, which has quickly become a global leader in, well, not a leader, but global player in analytics and marketing automation. So you can find out more about us at the website, of course. Now, what this talk is going to be about, firstly, we're going to talk about what this vegetable celery is and how you can use it even in your code instead of as food. Also, we will talk about when it is even appropriate to use celery and how uh, you could start with it. Uh, then we will talk about how Exponia uses celery to implement its campaign automation, which is, as Jeremy Clarkson would say, the best in the world. And finally, we'll talk about how we abused Celery in the process, because it wasn't an easy ride. And I'll share what we have learned so that you may not repeat our mistakes. So first of all, what is Celery? Officially, they call it a distributed task queue. And essentially, it means you can put some tasks into Celery's queue, and Celery will execute them at a time you want asynchronously. Uh, similar projects to Celery include, for example, the much simpler Redis queue or Dramatic, but Celery is most popular in its category. And I found the Celery logo a bit boring, so as you saw, I will be using my own. Hope you don't mind. Now, there is a bit of a prerequisite to using Celery. In the most common setup, you will also be using RabbitMQ, which is a message broker. Um, maybe you are familiar with Apache Kafka, uh, RabbitMQ is kind of similar, but takes a slight of a slightly different approach. Now, the, similar, the common setup also uses Redis for result backend, but if you don't plan to scan, scale your Celery cluster too much, you can actually use just Redis for the entire thing. Now, I also found RabbitMQ logo a bit boring. It's a cute rabbit. It has even two E's and an I, but I will be using this one because why not use a proper rabbit, right? Okay, so what might you, actually, might you actually do with Celery? So imagine you are processing in your Flask or Django application some request, for example, a registration, and while processing this request, you realize you would like to send an email to the user. So you can do this in the worker that is processing the request, but of course that will prolong the execution of, well, the processing of the same request. You don't want to do that, especially if there is some downtime on the emailing API. So you can just let Celery handle that as soon as possible. Celery also supports ETA tasks. Uh, this means that you specify when you would like to execute this task, and Celery will do that with some pretty good accuracy. Also, you can say, I want to do this task in 30 seconds from now. This is very useful, for example, when you want to retry something in case the service you are connecting to is temporarily unavailable. And also, you can use Celery to execute some periodic, for example, maintenance jobs. Uh, so it has a very similar syntax to, you, or, or the way you use it is quite similar to cron. So you can, of course, also use Celery if you are just too fancy to use actual cron. Now, the advantages of using Celery is, for example, that it, it is quite simple to set up for a developer. Not so much for your DevOps staff, because of RabbitMQ especially. So I guess you might say that Celery is very user-friendly. It's just kind of particular about who its friends can be. Now, Celery can also be used to easily build a scalable distributed worker pool. So this is something that a lot of companies need to do, and Celery lets you avoid doing all the boilerplate to do that. Celery also can be very fast. Uh, even the simple setup can easily process thousands of tasks per second. And if you use RabbitMQ, it also has quite low latency. You can usually get your tasks processed or start processing them less than a millisecond after you schedule them, which is very nice. Also, Celery has some management graphical user interface, which you can use to adjust some configuration even while Celery is running. It has lots of functionality, talking about Celery, and it's quite easy to extend. Now, I heard it's not a good idea to include code into a presentation, but I did it anyway, because Celery is just so simple to use. Uh, as you can see, I 
have a function called send greeting, which I would like the possibility to do this function or execute this function asynchronously. So I just add this very simple decorator for Celery. And then, as you can see on the left bottom part, I can still call the function like normally. This will execute it synchronously in the same worker as it's processing, say, the request. But I can also use the task method delay, which has the same signature as the function, but this will make sure the task gets processed in a Celery worker at the earliest convenience, so usually in real time. Also, you can use this a bit more ugly uh, syntax of using the apply async function, but this gives you the possibility to, to specify some other stuff, mainly when the task should execute, if you don't want to execute it immediately. Also, you can specify some queue uh, you would like to do, use, use for the task. We'll get to that later. On the right, you can see some basic example of running some periodic tasks. And the, the way that I configured it is in, is in this example would be useful for Celery 3 and with Flask. Uh, Celery also has a new version, uh, Celery 4. So sorry for that. This is, isn't very up to date. You should definitely start using Celery 4 when you start with Celery. Here are some examples of companies that use Celery. You can definitely see some big names here. <coughs> so even though Celery doesn't have a big budget, it is maintained quite well. And there is one more missing to the list, Exponia. So I would like to talk about what Exponia uses Celery for. First of all, I need to explain to you what we actually do when I say marketing automation or campaign automation. As you can see on this picture, Exponia allows you to define uh, some directed acyclic graph composed of nodes, which are some actions which can be performed on the customers. There is quite a variety of them, and each of these nodes will be executed in that order they are arranged in the graph for every customer that is affected by this campaign. Uh, Exponia can easily send hundreds of millions of emails a month. We do that, actually. And even worse, uh, people usually like to send their, for example, weekly newsletters at the same time. So the load on our campaigns is usually very concentrated. You can also use some notes like SMS messages, push notifications, Facebook messages. I actually saw some people using Exponia to implement a simpler uh, Facebook chatbot, so even that is possible. You can do adri, adri, oh, well, advert retargeting and A-B testing, and also you can use webhooks, which basically allow you to do any kind of other integration you would like. All of this can be highly personalized using Jinja templating language, because, for example, in the email note, you can insert a Jinja template, which renders the email's HTML code, and this is, isn't just standard Jinja. Apart from all the stuff you have in Jinja, you can also use some of our custom accessor thingies that allow you to, for example, query our in-memory database of customer data. So you can personalize this email however you want based on what you know about the customer. You can also request some recommendations and stuff like that. So this is how Celery falls into this, because on this graph of this campaign, each of the nodes you can see uh, has a few places where a Celery task may be used to advance the execution of this campaign for, for some customers. One Celery task usually uh, processes a chunk of customers because this is the way that is most efficient for our architecture. Uh, a single task may process hundreds or even tens of thousands of customers. We don't spawn a Celery task on every point you can see on this graph, on those dots but those are all the, all the places where tasks may be scheduled, and any task may then schedule other tasks to further implement the graph. So now we get to the promised abuse part, because to, even though this may sound simple, may sound simple or pap on paper, to execute all the kinds of various campaigns that our clients define, on a shared cloud environment, we had to do a lot of hacks to actually enable this. And we usually push Celery into its limits by using some functionality in a way that wasn't intended to be used in that way. 
Uh, full disclaimer, this talk will mostly cover issues we found with Celery 3.1.25, which is not the newest version, as I was mentioning. But I didn't see any changes in the release logs of Celery 4 that would suggest that any of these issues were already addressed. So I think this is still uh, up to date. So now I would like to mention some issues that we encountered and that got us from this, that we had no idea what we were doing, to this, that we had some idea of what we are doing. Because I still don't consider myself an expert on Celery, but I think the things that we learned might be useful for you if you ever decide to kind of bend Celery around to do your bidding. So one of the first problems we encountered, a beginner's mistake, was pushing a lot of data. So for example, IDs of customers that a single Celery task should process in the campaign. And we pushed this, all this data, possibly including some context data, as task arguments. We found out this is not the way you should use Celery, uh, because this way Celery will use up a lot of memory, mainly because uh, a single Celery worker doesn't just hold in memory the task definition or the task data of the task it is processing right now, but is also holding in memory some of the task it will process in the future and many tasks it has already processed in the past. This is especially true if you use uh, the stuff I mentioned, Celery Flower, for monitoring. Also, there are some synchronization mechanisms like cord and chain, uh, which basically allow, to allow you to say when this task complete, I want to execute this task or group tasks together and stuff like that. They are not implemented very efficiently if you are using RabbitMQ, so they will also consume a lot of memory, especially if your tasks have lar large arguments. There's large data in them. So basically what you should do is include only the definition. So that means what should be done, and the data should be still in some of, some of your databases and you will pull this data when the Celery task starts. So that was simple. Now to a kind of a bigger problem. As I said, we usually, um, most of our clients are on a shared cloud instance, which means that to process their campaigns, they use the same pool of Celery workers. Now this has a big issue because uh, when a campaign starts, especially a large one sending millions of emails, it will schedule a lot, like, I don't know, tens of thousands of Celery tasks very shortly after it starts. Now, if you use a single queue for all these tasks, this will mean that when the, the first campaign starts, as you can see on the picture, it will take some time, in this case, a few minutes, but it could be even a few hours, until any other task can be executed. So when a client uh, starts another client, which doesn't even have any idea, that client A is on, on the same instance, starts their campaign B, it doesn't do anything for an hour. So that's a big problem. What we use to solve this is using multiple Celery queues. With this solution, you can see that the resource usage of both campaign kind of gets balanced 50-50 or more uh, according to the amount of queues you have. So their campaign immediately starts doing something and we allocate as much resources as we can for their, ca their campaign in a fair way. Uh, usually, when you use multiple queues for Celery, which I definitely recommend doing because you have lots of tasks which have different needs, you will declare, th declare them statically, but you can also declare them dynamically. So for example, whenever a campaign was created in Exponia, we create a queue in Celery and RabbitMQ for this campaign. Now, Celery allows you to do this, uh, declare some queues even at runtime, but of course, just because the library allows you to do something, that doesn't mean you should do it. So we have had some problems with this. Um, the main problem on the start basically was that we were only creating these queues, we were never deleting them, but because you know, that's a problem for the next month, me, not me right now. So. The solution is quite simple. Just find the queues that you are no longer using and delete them when possible. This had a problem though, it would be just too simple. Because as we found out, when you delete a queue 
at runtime for Celery without restarting any workers and stuff like that. And then create a queue with the same name. Celery workers get kind of confused and they do a lot of stupid stuff. For example, they may lose tasks or they just don't process the task in the newly created queue at all. So that was a problem. There is fortunately an easy solution to that. If you ever delete a queue, never create a queue with the same name. So for example, if a client stops some campaign or this campaign stops automatically and the client restarts it, the queue that we create has a version suffix, which means it will be a different queue and, queue, uh, and salary workers will no longer be confused by it. Now, our campaigns, as you could saw in the graph I showed earlier, even have some wait nodes. And these wait nodes allow you to delay doing something. So for example, we, on one of the often use cases that people use Exponia for is uh, abandoned shopping cart scenario, which allows you to, whenever a customer updates their shopping cart, uh, Exponia's campaigns wait for an hour or two then they check whether the customer actually purchased something, and if they didn't, they send you a reminder. Hey, you left your shopping cart empty. Maybe you, well, well, you left something in your shopping cart. Maybe you would actually like to purchase it, because you know, revenue. So this is nice, and we allow also some plan triggers so that people can execute a campaign, for example, the next day during the night without actually having to wake up, obviously. But this has a problem because if you use RabbitMQ as the broker, it isn't implemented in a very efficient way because whenever you schedule an ETA task, saying, for example, this should execute the next day, throughout the next day, some salary worker will actually have this task in memory all the time and it will be waiting until it can execute. It can process some other tasks. Also, if you kill the salary worker, the task won't be acknowledged in Rabbit, so it gets executed on another worker. But obviously, this uses a lot of memory, and unfortunately, memory usage is kind of a recurrent theme with Celery. So how do you solve this? Well, we went with a solution that whenever we schedule an ETA task, we just to execute in, for, let's say, more than five minutes. We don't schedule it with Celery. We just put it aside into a database, and we have some job which reschedules those tasks as soon as it is about their time to execute. So this way you still get the precision that Celery allows you to execute a task exactly, for example, as many seconds as you like after you scheduled it, but doesn't consume as much memory. But I think this kind of starts to stink, right? Celery should do this itself. You shouldn't uh, have to do such hacks to use Celery properly without having it eating all your memory. Maybe the reason is that these ETA tasks were designed to be used for stuff like ret retries. For example, you try to send an email and the API gateway is down. Okay, so you retry it in 60 seconds. So if a task gets stuck in memory for 60 seconds, it isn't such a problem. I guess they never intended it to be used uh, with ETA of days and above. Now, one of the biggest problems we had with Celery was when a task simply disappeared. As you, could saw, as you could see in the implementation of our campaigns, a single task, uh, its purpose is to sc send an email or something to hundreds, possibly even tens of thousands of customers. And when these tasks get lost, you just don't do it, and the client is unhappy. So, um, the problem is that at times, uh, Celery or RabbitMQ or whatever were, was losing a lot of tasks, and we couldn't never we never could figure out why why or when this where this task loss was occurring. Maybe the issue was with RabbitMQ, but I mean we could never uh, confirm that because whenever we actually tried to look at what is wrong with Celery or RabbitMQ, the problem went away but the ta tasks were still missing. Also, there were no locked errors, so that's how we know it wasn't an issue with our application code because it would lock something as soon as the, start, as the task started executing. So either the tasks were disappearing in Celery or my personal opinion in RabbitMQ. It especially happened when the servers where the uh, RabbitMQ clusters was running 
were over overloaded, for example, when we were migrating RabbitMQ or something like that, it was the most uh, probable time for the Celery losing tasks. Also, Celery has some setting which you can use to only mark uh, the tasks or the me messages in RabbitMQ safe for deletion when the Celery task actually stops, uh, well, it, when it actually finishes. Uh, but to do this, you need your tasks to be idempotent, so you can safely run them twice, because it may happen that a task just doesn't get acknowledged in RabbitMQ, even though it finishes, or it, maybe it gets interrupted in the middle. So you already send some emails, but then another salary worker would just continue working on that task from the beginning, so sending some emails even twice. So we also couldn't use this because our tasks by, by nature are not idempotent. And to make them idempotent, we would have to, to do some application logic. Now, one of our company goals for the first quarter this year was that a less than one task should be lost in Celery. In this magic black box that we had no idea why it is even losing some task. So after laughing at this joke for a while, I realized it was my work assignment. So. I don't know what you should do when you have this library which is supposed to do something and it doesn't do it well, but I can tell you what I did and it was create my own library-ish. Because it's not a proper library yet, but it might be. I might publish it that open source, as open source code once it's ready and once it's well tested in production. Uh, this library uh, basically ensures that every task you schedule gets persisted in MongoDB with some checks to make sure that it really is there after you schedule it. And it still uses Celery to execute all the tasks. It is basically a wrapper above Celery. It also handles the stuff that I was talking about, about uh, ETA tasks with long uh, time to execute. So this won't consume as much memory. It also re-implements Celery synchronization mechanisms to be a bit more memory friendly and less buggy. So also we added some measurements to this framework or library-ish that measure some important stuff that Celery just doesn't do for yourself. So it's a, even a bit more user friendly. So you might be asking whether I was actually encouraging you to use Celery because it's so awesome or uh, I was telling you guys not to use Celery because you will have problems like we did. Well, it's kind of both. Uh, Celery can be a great tool if you use it the way it was designed to be used. But as some, soon as you start doing something fishy, you should be very careful and double check whether Celery is functioning properly and don't put too much money on it that it will. Yeah. And also make sure that your DevOps have enough coffee before, because uh, running a Celery cluster and especially RabbitMQ at a large scale can be a bit of a pain. So before I get to your questions, if you have any, okay. Uh, a short word from our sponsor, literally. Um, you, please stop by, by our Exponia yellow booth where you can meet me or even our CTO or some of our team leads. You can talk about the great work opportunities we have in Exponia. You can also win a lot of stuff if you, for example, fill some survey or ex complete a coding challenge, which is really good. I mean, I recommend doing that uh, just for the sake of learning all the stuff in there. You can win stuff like uh, the newest iPhone or Samsung phone or free launches, launches for month. And also you can grab some free st stickers and popcorn. Okay, so your questions now, please. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Um, there have been a number of questions. Uh, the one with the most upvotes. One thing that's hard with salary is long running tasks, especially when I need to redeploy the running worker. Do you have any recommendations? I actually forgot to mention this, yes, this is one of the big problems we have with Celery. Well, the way we circumvented this, because as I said, uh, our campaigns perform the best when they have large chunks of customers that they do the same action for. 
So for example, when sending a webhook, we have quite generous timeouts allowed for this webhook. So for example, 10 seconds. And if you are processing 100 customers, it can quickly get out of hand, right? So what we used to make sure that our salary tasks are as short as possible is Gvent. And thus we make sure that uh, the IO tasks that we do are completed as soon as possible so that you don't use Celery for parallelization because I don't think Celery was designed to be used for parallelization of IO operations. There are much better tools for that. As for deploying, yeah, I mean, you just you usually have to do rolling deployments, so you have to wait for all Celery tasks to finish at least twice, maybe three times. So you're just gonna have to live with that and make sure that your tasks execute as shortly as possible, possibly decreasing the chunk sizes if you have to. Another question, do you have a way to, uh, to use Celery to resend the emails that have not been delivered? Well, for example, if a task gets aborted, for example, by downtime of a server, uh, we not yet are able to re-deliver the emails that weren't sent in the chunk. This is something that I will be working on in the near future. Not yet, but this happens very rarely. The most common problems we had was that the Celery task never actually started executing. What are some of the limitations or downsides of Celery that you have experienced? Well, I think I mentioned quite a few of them. Not sure if I can think of more. Have you tried Redis as a broker for Celery? If yes, could you compare it to RabbitMQ? We haven't tried it, and I think at our scale, Redis just wouldn't take the load because RabbitMQ is much better suited for this kind of task. Redis is good if you want to deploy Celery easily and are not planning to um, scale it too much. Does your task, task method code differ from synchronous method code for preventing misdelivered emails? Well, we never actually sent any emails synchronously, so it does, there's just no difference because we never do that. Can you elaborate more why you chose RabbitMQ over Kafka or other candidates as underlying MQ system? I'm actually not sure if Celery even supports Kafka. Uh, for example, Celery, uh, well, RabbitMQ performs very well when you have lots of queues. As you could see in our presentations, at one point, we even had tens of thousands of queues. I think uh, Kafka, even if you had this many partitions, it isn't performing that well. Also, RabbitMQ has some additional mechanism for uh, ensuring the task is processed, even though apparently it didn't work. We experienced data loss in both Kafka and RabbitMQ, so I don't think Kafka would do any better, actually. Uh, we experience data loss in Kafka a lot more often than in RabbitMQ. Uh, let's have one final question. What was the most interesting use of Celery you have seen so far? Our campaigns, definitely. <laughs> like, no competition there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you.